Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for this webinar today. My name is Nicola Braganza. I'm a barrister specialising in discrimination, immigration and public law practising at Garden Court Chambers. And I'm very pleased to be chairing today's session. This is the first of a two part webinar series giving an update on community care law. We are focusing today on children and our second lunchtime webinar taking place tomorrow. At the same time, we'll focus on adults. We're providing a roundup of legislative case law and policy developments from 2022 to 23 in the areas of age assessments, children's social care and education law. And we are delivering that uh, with our very impressive panel of expert specialists. So before I introduce our speakers, a few housekeeping matters. First of all, the session is being recorded and we will upload the webinar to our YouTube channel and send out the slides, slides to you all. Um, we will have a Q&A session at the end. Hopefully we'll have time for questions. Please do put the questions into the Q&A box and we'll try and answer as many as we can. We're aiming to finish at around one and each of our speakers will speak for about 10 to 15 minutes. So to our speakers, I'm delighted to introduce to you, first of all, Ollie Percy. Ollie is going to be speaking on developments in education law. Ollie is a public law barrister who primarily represents children, people with disabilities and migrants. He has a particular interest in education and community care cases that have an Equality Act element to them and is a contributing author of the LAG practitioner text Discrimination in Public Law. Ollie is ranked as a tier one rising star in the Legal 500 in his core practice areas, which include education and community care. And then we have Nadia O'Mara, Nadia will speak to age assessments. Nadia is a public law barrister specialising in immigration, asylum, community care and education law. And prior to coming to the bar, Nadia worked in policy for leading UK human rights organisations and also provided legal advice and assistance to migrants in Lesbos, Greece. And then finally, Tessa, Tessa Buchanan. Tessa is going to speak to the Children Act, section 17 and 20. Tessa practices in the fields of housing, homelessness, community care, and gypsy and traveler law, with a particular focus on public law, human rights, and discrimination. She won Barrister of the Year at the Legal Aid Lawyer of the Year Awards in 2021. She's co-author of Housing Allocation and Homelessness and a contributing author to Gypsy and Traveller Law and the Housing Law Handbook. She's a member of the EHRC's panel of preferred counsel and her recent notable cases include the No DSS challenges brought by Shelter, Smith and SS for levelling up housing and communities, where the Court of Appeal found the government's planning policy in respect of gypsies and travellers to be unlawfully discriminatory. So we will begin with Ollie. I'll hand over to Ollie and I will mute myself. Thank you very much, Nicola. I'm just going to share my screen, which went completely smoothly in dress rehearsal. So fingers crossed that happens again. Can everyone see my screen? Just a quick thumbs up. Perfect. So I have the slightly difficult task of giving you a roundup of education law in 14 minutes, um, which is obviously not going to be the most comprehensive roundup that you'll see, but I hope to pick up on some interesting themes. And I appreciate lots of people in this call are not education practitioners, but these cases and uh, issues I'm identifying are broadly about discrimination against children, and so should hopefully be of wider interest. So oh, the three topics I'm speaking to are damages for disability discrimination claims against schools, the relationship and sexuality education um, guidance and code that was introduced in Wales and subject to legal challenge, and new Equality and Human Rights Commission guidance documents, including um, in relation to hair discrimination and the public sector equality duty, and a preview of some upcoming judgments on the public sector equality duty in the education sphere. So, First up is damages for disability discrimination claims against schools. And uh, sorry, there are lots of very experienced education practitioners here, but there are some that are not familiar with this jurisdiction. So just to give you a basic uh, recap on what the situation is in relation to disability discrimination claims against schools. 
if you have a discrimination claim against a school as a child or young person, for all the other protected characteristics, the claim goes in the county court. For disability, it goes in the first tier tribunal send chamber. Now, the key issue that was being grappled with in this case was, is it a breach of Article 14, the prohibition on discrimination in the European Convention, for there to be a carve out so that there are no vento or injury to feelings damages where a breach of the Equality Act is made out um, for a disabled child in a claim against a school. Now, the answer by the court was no. And just turning to the traditional four part test for an Article 14 ECHR claim, the first element is establishing that you're within the ambit of another convention right. So in this case, the claimants argued that the claim came within the ambit of Articles 8, the right to private and family life, uh, Article 2 of Protocol 1, the right to education, and Article 1 of Protocol 1, the right to property. And it only came within the ambit of the property right um, provision, not the others. And that's because applying something called the positive modality theory, um, the government had extended damages to the other areas or other protected characteristics, race, um, sex, etc., in claims. So it was by reference to there being uh, damages available for the other claims, an absence which engaged, for the, well, so it brought within the ambit for Article 14, this claim. Was there a difference in treatment? The court said no, but then proceeded on the basis that if there had been a difference in treatment, there was a relevant status here. Now, status is similar to the concept of protected characteristic, which you see in the Equality Act, but is a more flexible um, and nuanced concept in that you can have sort of cumulative characteristics or a more nuanced take on a protected characteristic. So here, the other status was disability, but a dis specifically a disabled pupil. Um, so proceeding on from status to justification, that claim, the claim also failed at that hurdle too. I'm just going to go through where the claim failed. So for an Article 14 claim, although the comparator requirements are slightly looser than in an Equality Act claim, you still need to have a relevant comparator. And here the claimants put forward other school complainants. So for example, a race discrimination claim being brought in the county court and those in higher education. So if you bring a disability discrimination claim against a university as a higher education student, that also goes in the county court and you can get damages. The claimants focused quite properly on the other school complainants because that was a closer, um, sit, more materially similar situation than the higher education example. Uh, the court held that ultimately there wasn't this unfavorable or different treatment because you're not comparing like with like because the first tier tribunal is a fundamentally different package than what is being offered um, in the county court. So it wasn't just county court minus damages, but on the, in the high court's view, there was a range of um, other benefits that uh, came from bringing a claim in the first tier tribunal. These included fewer pleading requirements, no costs or fees, generally no cost jurisdiction, a more inquisitorial element to the tribunal than in the county court, which made proceedings less adversarial and seemingly given a significant weight by the court, uh, more flexible remedies that were available um, in the first tier tribunal than in the county court. So you couldn't compare like with like, you had to look at the package as a whole. And sorry for the very basic use of image, but I hope having a package um, helps drive home the package principle. Um, so similarly, um, the claim failed on justification and the court proceeded on the basis that because it's concerned disability discrimination, this was a suspect ground where ordinarily weighty, very weighty reasons would be required to justify discrimination. The court considered there had been detailed consideration by Parliament in opting to exclude these damages and gave considerable weight to that. It went through the legitimate aims that I set out on the screen and found that actually they had to, it took a sort of more holistic approach and focused not on the individual, but on correcting the system for disabled students more generally and all of the other sort of 
package points, as I mentioned before. So, but also this concern about creating cost and cost for schools of defending these claims. So, claim failed. Rather, I think many education practitioners and others with um, experience of working with children with special educational needs and disabilities will think that maybe the court missed the point slightly here in this case, because it's all very well and good having all of these other remedies available, but do people want them? Um, and as you can see by the statistics that I put on the, um, the screen just now, um, it's quite staggering how few disability discrimination claims are brought in the first tier tribunal. When you compare that to the number of education healthcare plan related appeals or needs assessment related appeals, it's quite staggering that just so few are getting across the line. And it seems like the lack of damages is a serious disincentive to people bringing their claims in the first tier tribunal. So that's the case of AA. I understand that they're seeking permission to appeal to the Court of Appeal, um, and maybe it's a watch this space case to see what happens there. The next case I want to speak to is the case of Isherwood against Welsh ministers. Um, and this concerns a challenge to the relationships and sexuality education, which became a mandatory element of the new curriculum that was put in place in Wales. So it's important to remember that Wales is a devolved um, Education in Wales is devolved. It is not set by the Department for Education in England. Um, so the focus of this challenge was on two documents, the code and the guidance. And this case is a really fascinating judgment that you should read in full. I can only pick up on a couple of interesting points here. But if you're wanting to look at uh, the approaches, approach of the courts, post A against Secretary of State of the Home Department, which is the Supreme Court case that set out uh, the approach to unlawful policy documents and when the uh, court should interfere. This is also a good case for that purpose. Stain Jay goes through the authorities in some detail and explains why, um, even if you'd been with the claimants, maybe on substantive arguments on law, there wasn't a, an error in the guidance documents themselves. But ultimately, the court dismissed every aspect of this claim. I'm picking up on two elements of it. So the first is, does the common law provide for the constitutional parental right of excusal, which the claimants contended they have? So the crux of this claim was that the claimants had very apparently sincere concerns that their children were going to be indoctrinated by um, education that focused too much on what they considered the sexualization of children and um, focusing on LGBTQ plus identities, and in particular concerned about um, teaching around transgender individuals and the right to be transgender. Um, then the second ground is related to that is, was it a breach of Article 2 or Protocol 1, the right to education, which is what's called Lex Specialis, Article 9, which is the freedom of thought provision, so needed to be read in light of that. And did, did these did the code and the guidance breach um, the right to education by essentially proselytizing a uh, sort of pro LGBTQ plus view? So the two points are right of excusal, is it a common law right? And is it proselytization to be covering issues of sexual orientation and gender identity as set out in the code and guidance and required by the legislation? I'm not going to read it out in full, but this is how the claimants pleaded the constitutional right of excusal. As you'll see, it's quite a detailed and nuanced um, concept of a right, a common law right. So, for example, if you look at um, C, part C of this, a right to have their ob objections addressed reasonably. So it has reasonableness requirements built into it. You could cut one of two ways. And as you'll see by the next slide, it cut against the claimant. So you could say it kind of mitigated the sort of absolute and sort of um, sort of floodgates risk of having this right of excusal that could be used at any point and could undermine education. But equally, the courts were of the view that um, the caveats made it more similar to writing legislation than setting out a basic principle or constitutional right. 
Um, so I think the fundamental point is bullet point two here, which is it's not a choice about whether to enter a system of education such as state school, private school. Those are things that um, the courts would be happy to sort of recognize as a right, but a positive right to determine course content and have specific objections about how much could extend to how mass or English, et cetera, were taught, and would be a level of interference that, that the parliament has not allowed to exist. It is legislated in this field, the field is full, and the courts have not accepted such a constitutional right to exist, and to be slow to do so. So that claim failed on its, on about establishing a common law um, constitutional right of excusal. Very briefly, they also argue for um, that the curriculum was a, in breach of Article 2 of Protocol 1 slash Article 9 that actually be read into it. And the key point to take away from this part of the judgment is the court was, um, was clear that just teaching students that LGBTQ plus people exist does not constitute proselytization. Um, it is teaching them of, about an incontrovertible fact and does not constitute promoting or encouraging uh, a sexual identity or lifestyle. Um, and it cannot be incompatible with the requirements of pluralism and objective criticism to teach um, children that LGBTQ plus people should be treated with uh, should be treated equally and with respect. Um, so finally, in my last minute, I'm going to draw your attention to a couple of new guidance documents put together by the Equality and Human Rights Commission that will be useful to anyone dealing with equality related issues with schools. The first one is in relation to hair discrimination, and that's a photo of Ruby Williams, which was the case that led to um, much more consideration around uh, school uniform policies that prohibit um, Afro style hair and that being indirect race discrimination. Uh, the EHRC guidance includes very helpful examples for schools and others when formulating uniform policies. Similarly, the public sector equality duty um, guidance for schools includes useful points, including in relation to school exclusions. I very briefly wanted to flag three cases where two judgments are waiting and one case is going to be heard next month. The first is in relation to the issue of whether the first tier tribunal has jurisdiction to consider the public sector equality duty um, when determining substantive discrimination. Um, you cannot bring PSED as a separate ground of challenge, but there is case law descending from Cole downwards, which says that public sector equality duty compliance is relevant to the question of justification. So the, we had the hearing at the end of November, the upper tribunal will be handing down guidance at some point later this year, setting out whether the first year tribunal does have jurisdiction to consider public sector equality duty compliance and what effect would that, that would have on a discrimination claim. The second one is um, a, claim in, a claim for judicial review against the local authority around section 42 of the Children and Families Act. Again, that hearing was at the end of last um, year and it's a case Nicola will be very familiar with. Um, and we're waiting for a judgment on that. Um, it particularly focuses on the importance of equality monitoring where there's another protected characteristic in play and potentially discrimination against that other protected characteristic is stop not disability is stopping um, or interfering with um, the local authority securing provision in the education healthcare plan. And the final point is what the public sector quality duty uh, requires in relation to the permanent exclusion of a black and disabled child. And there's a final hearing and a judicial review on that next month. I think I've come in about just over 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Brilliant, thank you, Ollie. Um, and I think we now go to Nadia. Nadia. Thank you, Nicola, and um, thank you, Ollie, for that. I am going to set myself a timer as well and try and share my screen. One moment. Hopefully you can all see that all right. Yeah, 
Um, so I'm going to talk about age assessments. Um, I have quite a lot of slides, so I'm going to go through them quite quickly, but they will be shared afterwards. I'm going to discuss three cases, um, two from the domestic courts and one from Strasbourg, and then I'm going to whip through the um, the legislative provisions pertaining to age assessments in the NBA 2022. Turning then to, to the first case, it's um, the Court of Appeal judgment in the challenge to the Secretary of State's KIU guidance. Um, this guidance came into force in September 2020, but was um, withdrawn uh, for reasons unrelated to the litigation in January 2022. And so in some ways, this, this challenge had, had become academic but is an important judgment in terms of challenges to the lawfulness of, um, of guidance documents. The KIU guidance related to um, the conduct of short form age assessments conducted by social workers and home office uh, officials at the Kent intake unit in Dover. The reason um, behind the introduction of this guidance was at the relevant time Kent County Council um, had refused to provide newly arrived unaccompanied young people with um, statutory care pursuant to the Children's Act. And so this guidance document was introduced in, in a bit of a rush to say the least. Um, that guidance document provided for the um, short term detention and, and processing of newly arrived young people through a truncated age assessment process. Um, the two claimants in this case challenged the guidance on the grounds that it was um, both unlawful insofar as it was incompatible with the Secretary of State's own um, guiding policy on age assessments and also that it was a breach of um, the Secretary of State's duty under Section 55. Uh, the claimants were successful in the High Court. In summary, um, it was found that the KIU guidance and then therefore the decisions flowing from that with respect to the two um, it shouldn't say respondents, apologies, um, were unlawful and that their um, detention um, was also unlawful because it had been lengthened uh, for the purposes of carrying out age assessments. The Secretary of State appealed and was granted um, permission on one quite narrow ground. And um, much like Ollie was speaking about in, in the Welsh case, um, really the, the crux of this judgment is concerned with the correct approach um, uh, as, as set out by the Supreme Court in RA and then also in, in BF Eritrea uh, in respect of um, cases where, where policy is, is alleged to be unlawful by reason of what it says or omits to say about the law. Um, in summary, the Court of Appeal found um, in, in favour of the Secretary of State and held that on um, a correct application of, of the principle in Gillick, as explained um, quite recently by the Supreme Court in both RA and BF Eritrea, the KIU guidance, <clears throat> excuse me, was not unlawful and, and the judge was, was wrong to conclude otherwise. Um, most of the Court of Appeals discussion in this case um, focuses on, on the judgment of Lord Sales and Burnett in RA, which identified three categories of case in which it could be found unlawful, um, a policy document could be found unlawful by reason of what it says or omits to say about the law when giving guidance to others. I won't read out the three categories. The, the one that is um, relevant to the present challenge is, is the first bullet, which is where a policy includes a positive statement of law, which is wrong and which will induce a person um, who follows it to breach their legal duty in some way. Um, Apologies. Yes. Um, so the Court of Appeal agreed with um, the submission of the Secretary of State that the only category which could apply in the present case, what was the first point that I have just read out. Um, but looking at the, the present matter, the KIU guidance um, did not purport to provide a full account of the legal position insofar as it cross referred to other policies and directed those um, applying that guidance to consider the relevant case law. And um, while it provides examples, um, those are, are plainly non-exhaustive. 
Um, the court then considered in, in further detail the judgment in BF Eritrea and notes that the proper application of the Gillick principle involves comparing the underlying legal position and the direction in the policy guidance to see if the latter contradicts the former. Crucially, what it does not involve is, is comparing a, a norm, normative statement with um, a prediction of, of what might happen if, if the person uh, applying the guidance um, is, is given no further information. Um, at, at common law, there is no obligation to promulgate a policy which removes the risk of possible misapplication of the law. Applying those principles um, to the KIU guidance, um, the, the Court of Appeal held that the KIU guidance did, in fact, um, encourage social workers and, and immigration officers to comply with their le legal duties. And there was no obligation on the Secretary of State to set out a comprehensive statement of, of what was required to achieve this. The onus remained on, on the social worker, um, taking into account um, other policy guidance and, and the Merton line of authorities to conduct a procedurally fair assessment of age. Again, there was there was nothing in the guidance that um, could be could be framed as an uh, incorrect statement uh, of the law, and there was nothing in the guidance which required that age assessments be conducted without an appropriate adult or a minded to process, even if this is what happened in practice. Um, as to the uh, flaws within the judge's reasoning. The Court of Appeal focused quite a lot on, on the judgment's assessment of, of a pro forma, which, um, which uh, the, the guidance uh, required those applying it to use. However, what the Court of Appeal found was that the pro forma was not part of the guidance and, and the judge was wrong to treat it as such. That pro forma was an administrative instruction rather than a direction of law. Um, and again, it, it, it did not purport to provide an exhaustive checklist and the existence of, of tick boxes did not suggest that um, some of the um, some of the, the provisions within that pro forma were optional. And again, just the, the final point and the, the kind of key point within this judgment is, is that the, the judge had erred in conflating the terms of the guidance itself with the way in which it is or may be operated um, by those it applies to. Turning then to the second case that I want to discuss, um, it's the case of Ham and London Borough of Brent. Uh, I, I would say that this is recommended reading for any practitioners that that um, work on age assessments, the judgment is from Mr. Justice Swift, and in in many regards, the the judgment sort of resets the age assessment procedure and and what will or will not constitute a lawful assessment. In some ways, the the judgment may be. Um, may have some cause for, for concern insofar as Mr. Justice Swift somewhat limits what may be required for a fair process in some cases. However, what is welcome in the judgment uh, is his very clear statement that fairness is a matter of function and substance and, and not merely form. Um, I won't go into much detail on the facts, but in short, um, the claimant was a Sudanese national who claimed to be 17 years old. He was assessed by both the KIU and Brent to be 23. Brent undertook a short form assessment, a short form assessment um, <clears throat> or, or purported to, uh, but instead of simply considering the claimant to be clearly and obviously an adult, he was um, nevertheless interviewed. And um, within that interview process, not all of the discrepancies within his account uh, were, were put to him for his response. Um, the, the crux of this judgment is essentially that um, while a lawful age assessment um, must be the product of a fair procedure, what that looks like will depend on the specific facts of each individual case. I have set out some, some key principles um, this, that Swift relied on in, in his judgment. In, in short, a, an age assessment um, decision must be based on, on a Thameside duty of inquiry. Um, insofar as a local authority must take the steps which are reasonable in the case at hand to obtain the information needed and to take the decision it's required to take. This will look different in different cases. 
Um, but say where, for example, an interview is, is, is carried out, that must be done fairly. Credibility must be dealt with head on and um, any adverse um, points must be put to the um, putative child. Um, contrary to, to some of the um, some of the earlier line of case law, Swift was quite firm that there is no sort of strict set of um of, of procedural requirements or, or a checklist um it it is a matter um a matter of um a matter of substance in in each individual case um going into a bit more detail on what fairness and procedure will require um swift uh in in obiter commented that that fairness does not always require there to be two social workers nor does it always require an appropriate adult to be present this um does not mean that age assessments should not have two social workers or an appropriate adult but it will not um be required in every single case A helpful um, clarification that comes from the judgment is um, Swift's discussion of a, a distinction between short form age assessments and full Merton compliant age assessments. Um, Swift uh, comments on the fact that um, many local authorities have started had started to sort of rely on, on somehow there being this binary distinction between a short form and a Merton compliant age assessment. Um, derived largely from home office guidance, which, which applies um, not to local authorities, but, but to age assessments conducted by the Secretary of State. Um, Swift describes uh, this distinction as, as a legal irrelevance. Um, and uh, in, in the context of, of assessments carried out by the Secretary of State, those are carried out for immigration purposes and, and those are a means to an end in a particular context. And therefore, none of the features of those assessments read over to uh, assessments by local authorities for the purposes of um, discharging duties under the Children's Act. Um, I am conscious of time, so I will leave um, the rest of uh, these slides to be read um, in, in your own time. Moving then very quickly to um, a Strasbourg case in uh, Darbo and Camara against Italy. The key points from this case um, are um, that the Strasbourg court found Italy to have breached articles three, eight and 13 um, in, in relation to a putative child from Guinea. Um, in terms of the <clears throat> court's findings on article eight, um, the court held that article eight includes positive obligations to comply with the requirements of international law regarding the asylum and age assessment process. Crucially, a person's age is, is part of their personal identification and recognition of, of their status as a child is, is crucial for protecting their rights. Um, the court focused on really a litany of, of procedural failures within the Italian system, but quite, quite frustratingly did not focus on, um, on the substantive decision in this case so much. Um, but what it did nevertheless do is um, uh, point to, to certain failures, for example, the, the failure to provide a legal guardian or representative, the failure to, to issue a proper decision and, and so on. Um, the applicant in this case as a, as a result of the adverse um, age assessment spent four months in an adult reception centre and the Strasbourg course also found that this was a breach of article three. Um, finally uh, this case is an important statement of principle from Strasbourg regarding the need for a proper age assessment process which complies with international law standards and in, in the UK context will be a helpful judgment to rely upon for ensuring that the age assessment process does comply with international law requirements, even where those are not directly incorporated into domestic law. Um, I have not done as well as Ollie and I am almost out of time. I will run over a few minutes um, just to whip through the um, age assessment provisions within the Nationality and Borders Act. Um, so by, by way of brief overview, part four of the NBA is intended to bring age assessments within the statutory immigration system, whereas they had previously um, developed in, in line with case law. 
Uh, it, it goes without saying, of course, that it's it's critically important to get the assessment of age right, um, both in terms of um, whether or not a person can be detained and also the, the numerous educational and social care rights which, which arise. Um, the section 49 of, of the Act provides various definitions. An age disputed person is defined to be an individual who, who requires leave to enter the UK. Um, Crucially, this is um, this is a bit broader than than what we may be used to insofar as these procedures apply to all people who require leave, not just asylum seekers. Um, the second important point is um, this definition of a designated person. So this is an individual designated by the Secretary of State to conduct an age assessment. And while it's not addressed on the face of the bill, the explanatory notes and, and subsequent policy statements um, lead us to to be aware of the fact that what will be introduced is a national age assessment board um which will be a newly constituted entity that will consist of home office employed social workers um section 50 addresses persons subject to immigration control who are being um referred uh, or assessed by local authorities so section 50 applies where a local authority needs to know the age of an age disputed person or where the Secretary of State notifies a local authority that it has doubts as to the age of an age disputed person that the local authority has, has exercised um, functions uh, under the Children Act 1989. When that does occur, the local authority um, must take one of three steps. It can either refer the age disputed person to the NAAB, it can conduct an age assessment itself, or it can confirm that an age assessment is not necessary. Um, when the designated person, which will be the NAAB, conducts the age assessment on behalf of the Secretary of State, that outcome is, is binding on the LA, but, but not the other way around. Uh, on the converse, where a local authority does conduct an age assessment or confirms that, that one is um, not necessary, it must provide uh, evidence to the Secretary of State on, on request so that the Secretary of State can consider the decision. Um, Section 51 applies where the Secretary of State needs to make a decision um, relating to its immigration functions uh, as connected to, to an age disputed person. This can um, be carried out where Section 50 is, is not relevant or before the local authority has um, referred the individual to the Secretary of State. Um, Section 51 is, is binding on the Secretary of State uh, in connection with immigration functions. Uh, very quickly, Section 52 has, has been much discussed and is obviously a point of significant concern, but the um, statutory provision for, for the use of, of scientific methods in, in the assessment of age. Um, what is um, of, of further concern in, in this regard is that while the use of scientific methods may only be used with appropriate consent, Section 55.7 provides for, um, for adverse credibility findings that, that must be um, taken into account um, where, uh, where a um, putative child uh, does not consent to the specific scientific method. Um, just to whip through again, then the final key points on this are sections 54 and 55, uh, which put appeals relating to age assessments on a statutory footing and, um, and transfer that jurisdiction to, to the first tier tribunal. Uh, any determination made by the first tier tribunal will be binding on the local authority uh, and the Secretary of State. Section 56 provides that where there is significant new information, um, which creates a realistic prospect that uh, there would be a different outcome from the original assessment, then a fresh assessment must be undertaken. And Section 57 provides for legal aid for age assessments. Um, just in, in terms of uh, final points on, on the on the Act, uh, many points do require clarification and will need to be interpreted by, by the courts um, or, or further guidance from the Secretary of State. In the context of the use of scientific methods, it, it is quite likely that um, challenges will be mounted uh, on the basis of Articles 3 and 8. 
Um, query how much will change if age assessments are still being conducted by social workers and um, whether and to what extent departure from, from the Merton guidelines uh, is to be expected. And then finally, as, as these um, provisions are not yet in force, it, it is a question of watching this space. I will now hand back over with my apologies right. to the chair for running over. So thank you very, very much. It was really helpful. Thanks, Nadia. Tessa. Great. Thanks so much, Nicola. So I'm going to be talking about um, Section 17 and 20 of the Children's Act of 1989. Um, a very brief review of, um, sorry, can you fix me? Yeah. Um, of the statutory provisions with, with, with which I'm sure um, everyone will be familiar. I'm going to look at some of the um, most interesting cases from last year and then have a brief look ahead to some themes which um, might be emerging in the forthcoming investigation. So uh, section 17 is of course the general duty on local authorities to safeguard and promote the welfare of children within the area who are in need. Uh, and so far as it's consistent with that, promoting the upbringing of children by their families by providing a range of level of services. Although it is a general or target duty, local authorities do have to act so as to promote the object of the statute and if they make a decision that uh, they won't provide needs which they've assessed as being necessary then that's a decision which is likely to be subjected to uh, a strict and maybe sceptical scrutiny as it was described in the case of BC. The services which may be provided can be provided to the family if the child in need as well as the child uh, himself or herself. It can include accommodation, assistance in kind and cash. And um, underlying that duty is the obligation to assess the needs of the child and fairly obviously in order to establish whether there are needs and how they should be met. Um, so that's section 17 and obviously it's a duty owed in respect of children in need who are defined at section uh, 17, so sections 10 and 11. A uh, child will be in need if they're unlikely to achieve or maintain or to have the opportunity of achieving or maintaining a reasonable standard of health and development without the provision of services under part three, uh, or their health or development is likely to be significantly impaired or further impaired without the provision of such services, or the child is disabled, which is defined as I've put in that uh, third bullet point there in, in now updated language. And then we have section 20. This is the individual duty to provide accommodation for any child in the area of the local authority who appears to the local authority to require accommodation as a result of there being no person who is parental responsibility for him or her, his or her having been lost or abandoned, or the person who's been caring for him or her being prevented from providing suitable accommodation or care. And there is another duty under section 23 that's 20 subsection 3, to provide a foundation for any child in need in their area who's 16 or over and whose welfare the authority consider is likely to be seriously prejudiced if accommodation isn't provided. Uh, the local authority can't provide accommodation under this section if the child is under 16 and somebody with parental responsibility both objects and is willing and able to provide accommodation. And the House of Lords has also said that it's unlikely to be reasonable to force a child who has been properly and fully advised and has the uh, capacity to make the decision to accept accommodation under Section 20 or if they don't want to. Um, but conversely, the local authority themselves can't choose whether or not to provide accommodation under Section 20 or some other power or duty. Um, and they can't in particular decide to provide accommodation under Section 17, for example, uh, if the duty under section 20 has arisen. So looking now at some of the cases which uh, came out in the last year, I'm going to look at three cases in a little bit more detail and then have a brief scan through some of the appearances of section 17 and 20 in, in other areas. So article 39, um, section 6 for um, education was a case which came out uh, in to early last year, so it's a case with which you'll probably be familiar. It concerned an amendment made to the care planning placement and case review regulations, which had the effect of providing that a looked after child who is under 16 cannot be placed in other arrangements or unregulated accommodation, but which did not make the same provision in respect of looked after children aged 16 or over. So the amendment stated that 
uh, looked after a child under 16 can't be placed in for other arrangements, which is the term used in section 22C, unless it's one of a number of specified placements, which are things like hospitals, residential care homes, uh, schools providing accommodation which aren't registered as children's homes. Or there was another limited exception created for formerly age disputed children, which is in essence that if a child uh, has been age disputed or had the, the, their age is uncertain, they claim to be 16 or 17, but they've later been assessed as being under 16, uh, then they can be placed in the other arrangements and they can stay there for 10, 10 working days following the assessment of them being aged under 16, after which uh, that they would have to be moved. So it is a very limited exception. Article 39 brought a claim for judicial review of the failure by the government to extend this prohibition on the use of unregulated arrangements to 16 and 17 year olds. And the claim was advanced on a number of grounds, none of which were upheld by the court. Uh, the court found that firstly there was nothing in the act itself which made the provision of such accommodation to 16 and 17 year olds of children and lawful, it wasn't ultra-virus under the Act, uh, and it wasn't irrational to distinguish between children who are under 16 and children who are over 16, uh, because the court said there was evidence to show that whilst unregulated accommodation would be unsuitable for everyone who's under 16, that wouldn't necessarily be the case for all children aged 16 and over. Uh, and then finally, the case was challenged in respect of the consultation which had preceded the amendment, and the court found firstly that the Secretary of State didn't have to have regard to the equality implications of something which he wasn't considering doing effectively. He didn't have to consider the equality implications of extending the prohibition to 16 and 17 year olds because that wasn't part of the proposal. And equally, he didn't have to seek views on the possibility of extending the prohibition because the consultation had made clear that the status quo was going to be maintained for 16 and 17 year olds. So the court found that that was obviously going to be the case and that people could have commented if they wanted to uh, and some people did do that. So the result is that it's not necessarily unlawful for a 16 or 17 year old looked after child to be placed in other arrangements for unregulated accommodation. But equally, that doesn't mean that it's always going to be lawful to do that. The obligation is still to place such a child the most appropriate placement available, that comes from section 22C, and their particular needs will have to be considered. So it may be that on the fact of an individual case, um, other arrangements are not the most suitable placement for that child. And just to kind of draw out a possible silver lining, um, it could be that there is some help for retrospective care leaver cases or for uh, retrospective form relevant child cases, i.e. a child who um, says that they have been accommodated under section 20 um, and the, the local authority disputes that in that if they've been accommodated in other arrangements uh, now it, it won't be open to for example a local authority to say well that placement can't have been under section 20 because it would be unlawful um, because there was no presumption of legality for 16 or 17 year olds in respect of unregulated uh, placements Secondly, the case of LB in Surrey, this concerned a child with complex needs arising from diagnoses of autism spectrum disorder and ADHD. She moved home after um, a problem arose with the full-time residential school placement where she had been residing. And effectively, after a temporary move to another placement, um, arrangements were put in place either in respect of or Unsatisfactory, no satisfactory arrangements put in place in respect of her accommodation or her education. It was uh, conceded by the defendant that the Section 20 duty was owed um, and that the defendant hadn't discharged that duty by placing the payment in her mother's home. It was also argued and found by the court that the defendant had failed to carry out an assessment of the claimant's needs under section 17 because there'd been a material change in her circumstances uh, in the fact that she'd moved home and the defendant had not complied with the continuing duty to review its uh, care and placement plans and, and the provision of services under section 17 and there were also challenges brought under the duty to carry out a care and carers needs assessment under section 17d and various education duties 
And the case is interesting and uh, worth looking at because of the findings made by the judge in respect of relief. In essence, the defendant argued that, you know, despite the findings in terms of breach, it, that there wasn't anything available and therefore it wouldn't be possible to comply with any uh, relief ordered and therefore no relief should be ordered. And the court rejected that argument uh, and said that it was appropriate to order relief um, and that relief would serve a practical purpose. And in, in addition to declaratory relief, said that uh, certain steps to provide education uh, and uh, provide accommodation and review and prepare the care plans had to be taken within 30 days. Uh, and then this third case was handed down just last week. It's a, a really interesting case in respect of the provision made for families with no recourse to public funds uh, under Section 70 and the interaction between that and Article 14. In essence, it was argued that by paying families with British children the same amount as families with non-British children, um, that was preliminary discrimination, i.e. Um, treating unlike cases alike in a way which couldn't be justified. And I should say, I've, I've summarised it there for, for two, but in fact, the state has relied on, uh, there were a number of facets to the state has relied on, which I've put uh, under the second bullet point to the second sub bullet point. So British and non-British children with a foreign carer and with no local public funds, or British children and asylum seeking or other precarious immigration children with no recourse to public funds, foreign carer would leave, or children with a carer with leave and children with carer without leave. Um, so it, it is a very complex judgment, um, and I've briefly summarised it there. There is also a very good summary on the website of the Central Indian Law Centre, who with the solicitors bringing the case. Uh, but in essence, that the court upheld the claim and found that there was unjustified discrimination uh, because the needs of British children or children with foreign care or with leave were different um, for various reasons and that they were being treated the same as, as children who were not British or whose foreign care didn't have leave and that that wasn't justified and various arguments were advanced in respect of convenience, practicality and also avoiding discrimination claims brought by uh, as it were, the comparative group, uh, but all of those were rejected by the judge. Then to look briefly at a few cases where Section 17 and Section 22 have uh, appeared in, in other contexts. Uh, firstly, the case of Patton and uh, the Assistant Coroner with Monitor in Pembrokeshire. Uh, I, I flag this really because I think it's the first case, or one of the first cases, reported uh, in respect of Section 76 of the Social Services and Wellbeing of Wales Act, which is the Welsh equivalent to the GT uh, under Section 20 and is in material terms the same. And uh, that arose in a slightly unusual context in terms of a challenge to a coroner's decision and the question was, to, was as to how the coroner had um, engaged with whether or not that GT had arisen. Um, but it's interesting uh, to see some case law on that GT. Section 17 also came up in a welfare benefits case, Secretary of State for Work and Pensions and AT. Uh, this was as to the relevance of Section 17 in this case was to what degree it should be taken into account or relied upon in finding that the claimant uh, would not be able to live in dignified conditions without the grant of universal credit and the tribunal held that it, it can't be relied on in a generalised way. So the Secretary of State can say, well, it's there, Section 17 exists. What matters is whether support would actually be provided um, and AT which had shown that she tried to get support into that section and failed. Uh, a few cases on the interaction between section 20 and care orders and the main points to draw out of here are firstly the court has confirmed again that there isn't a time limit to how long somebody can be accommodated under section 20 um, before having to move on to a care, care order. Um, and uh, also, the court declined to make care orders where satisfactory arrangements are in place under Section 20. And then finally, in terms of the case law review, um, a couple of interesting cases I've said negligence, one of them in fact is a human rights claim. Um, and the first one, HXA, the court allowed appeals against strikeouts, um, saying that, that it was argued very broadly that the um, way in which the defendant had engaged with its responsibilities under the Children Act and Part 3 had, uh, in Part 3 in one of those cases, 
had given rise effectively to a duty of care, which then had been complied with, and the court said that uh, effectively that might be the case and it shouldn't have been struck out. And then also a claim for damages under the Human Rights Act for what was said to be a failure to uh, comply with obligations to vote for a relevant child. And then very briefly looking ahead, um, I'm sure everyone will be aware, as it's been widely reported in the news, of this issue of uh, unaccompanied asylum seeking children being held in hotels. And we found out on, I think it was Tuesday, in response to an urgent question, that the numbers are really quite are really huge. Over 4,600 children accommodated in hotels, of which 440, well, there have been 440 missing occurrences. It wasn't clear to me whether those were individual children or whether it could be repeat cases. But a huge number of children go missing, of which 200 remain missing. And um, of course, concerns have been raised about this, uh, about children being abducted or trafficked into gangs, and the, the use of hotels for children has been criticised by an open letter signed up to one of the hundred charities. Uh, and it seems to me that um, really quite difficult to see any lawful basis for the accommodation of such children in hotels. And the Secretary of State obviously has the power to accommodate destitute or failed asylum seekers under the Immigration Act 1999, sorry, Immigration Act 1999, uh, but an asylum seeker is defined as somebody aged over 18. But that doesn't seem to avail the Home Secretary um, in this instance. And unaccompanied asylum seeking children should be being accommodated by local authorities under Section 20. Uh, and if they are accommodated under Section 20, then it's going to be very difficult to see how they could be put in hotels lawfully. If they're under 16, then they can't be placed in a regulated accommodation, um, as uh, was the, the issue in the Article 39 case. And even if they're over 16, such free guidance is very clear that hotels would be suitable. Um, so it does seem to be very um, dubious that these children are, are being held uh, in this accommodation. And then finally, a couple of comments on an issue which I referred to earlier, which is the question of choice. Uh, as I said, a child can reject accommodation of Section 20. They can say, I don't want to be provided with accommodation of Section 20. I want this other service or accommodation not in Section 20. Um, but clearly in doing that, you know, that's very likely to be a choice which is not in their best interests. And um, for that reason, statutory guidance strongly, um, quite strong advice as to the care that must be taken and properly advising young people before they reach that decision, before that decision is to relied upon by the local authority. Certainly any assertion by a local authority that a child is rejected at Section 20 should be um, looked at with, with close scrutiny. And I think also, uh, this is a point I'll, I'll, I'll finish on, the question has to be asked whether or not the young person is being given a choice which is lawful. It's one thing for a young child or for a young person to say, I don't want a combination of Section 20, but it's another thing in my view for a local authority to say, do you want accommodation under Section 20, or do you want this other accommodation which isn't being provided under Section 20? Um, and whether or not that's a lawful choice that can be offered is something which um, I think is um, likely to come up uh, in the next few months, um, or, or it's an issue that, that seems to be being looked at. Um, so thanks. On that note, I'll pass back to the floor for any questions. Thank you very much, Tessa. That was really helpful as well. I'm I'm sorry if there were slight sound issues with that. Um, we, as I say, the 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 webinar will be sent out, and the slides are all very comprehensive. So hopefully, um, they will assist as well. I don't think we have any other questions. It's just gone one o'clock. I'll is is there anything that anyone would like to ask before I wrap up this session? I'll give it I'll give it a few seconds. Well, if you if you do have any questions, please feel free to contact us. Um, thank you to our excellent speakers and thank you to all of you for joining us. And hopefully you'll be joining us for our part two tomorrow. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care, everyone. I'm now going to log this off. Thank you. Bye.